द ट्रुथ द सोल इज फर्स्टली नॉट समथिंग दैट कैन बी ग्रैस्ड एंड वेन इट एग्जिबिट्स इट सेल्फ मैनिफेस्ट्स इट सेल्फ देन यू कैन ग्रैस्प इट बट वॉट एवर यू विल ग्रैस्प will change the next moment so again you are beaten it's like this understand you look at the moon and the moon is beautiful and what do you like about the moon you like the moonlight is there moon without the moonlight and does the moon hold any attraction then the moon and the moonlight are one but do you know the source of the moonlight when the moonlight is there then the source of the moonlight is rarely there rarely do you see moonlight and the source of moonlight together but fine you may say that we may not see them together but we do see the sun even if in isolation at other times so we know the source of the moonlight and we are able to perceive it we are able to perceive the sun but do you really know the source of sunlight to know the source of sunlight you will have to know the source of the light in your own eyes without your eyes is there sunlight without a perceiving eye is there sunlight and to know the source of the light in your own eyes you will have to know the source of consciousness now consciousness cannot go into its own source because when you say that you want to know the source of consciousness it is your consciousness that is saying that it wants to know its own source difficult consciousness is always directed outwards it is not designed to travel within it will never know from where it is sprouting are you getting it so first of all as far as the moon is concerned you will never really know where that charming moonlight is coming from to know where that charming moonlight is coming from you will need to know your own source you will need to know your own soul hmm but we may still say that why does it matter where the moonlight is really coming from is the moon not sufficient why do we need to dig deep the moon is there and one loves the moon the moon is there and one loves the moon one is not interested in philosophical or metaphysical questions like the source of the moonlight one says i just want to live in the present i just want to live in that which is obvious and manifest i don't want to go deeper i love the moon then the argument is all right but then lalla would smile and ask which moon do you love which moon do you love the moon on the first of the month the moon on the fifth of the month the moon on the 10th of the month or the moon on the 15th of the month which moon do you love that is the thing with truth when it exhibits itself it does so in ever changing ways so it beats us both ways when it does not exhibit itself 
you have no way of knowing it because then knowing the truth would require knowing your own essence one is caught one is stuck it's an impossible task and when one says that i will confine myself to the manifested truth then the problem that one faces is that the manifestation is continuously changing so which manifestation do you like nothing in the universe stays still even for a microsecond everything is continuously continuously changing that is why allah in the opening few lines talks of the moon and the ocean what you call as the ocean is an abstraction a mere idea really is there a thing called an ocean the ocean is forever changing which ocean do you love the ocean at 12 noon the ocean at 1 pm the high tide the low tide which ocean are you talking of loving the truth or knowing the truth presents us with great difficulties we want to love a thing and the truth is never a thing it is never a thing when it is not manifested and even when it is manifested it is a flux continuously changing never a definite frozen thing in the universe actually nothing called a thing exists everything is in movement so if you want to love the movement only then you can love the universe if you want to love the universe you will have to love the universe with all its movements because there is nothing called a stalled universe a stationary universe and that is the trouble with loving you love an idea you love a frozen idea you love an idea with a boundary the reality is always in motion and that is why our love falls flat you love pictures reality is like a video your love cannot cope with videos you can at most love pictures and pictures are easier to love because pictures can be co-opted you look at somebody's smiling face and you say this is the one that i love the one whose face you are seeing smiling in the frame had actually started frowning right after the click but that won't be visible in the picture that won't be visible you are stuck at the smile the smile came and went away the frown too went away if you really want to love the person you will have to love the flow that the person is and the flow is not really controllable not very definable if the person is real then the flow will be a wild flow not predictable how to love and that is why we do not want to love the wild we are far more comfortable loving somebody who is well defined predictable within norms within bounds if someone who is totally his own in our words random hm patternless comes in front of us this person will be very difficult to love we can love only that which we first know 
and we have a great urge to know because unless we know, unless we have knowledge, we cannot control. The ego is so afraid all the time that it cannot live without knowledge of the other. Mind you, you want to have knowledge about the other so that you do not feel afraid. So that you can have some security and some control, some defense with respect to the other. Are you getting it? Lalla is saying the moon is indeed lovely. But how do you love the moon? The moon is really so fickle. The moon keeps no promises. You might be a poet and you might be writing a beautiful hymn to the moon tonight. And what does the moon do tomorrow? It changes. You are betrayed. And you may keep complaining. The moon will keep changing. The moon is changing even as you are writing the hymn. The moon is changing even as you are offering the verse. So is the ocean. Always in movement. Always in movement. To love, to know. You will have to either settle in the fact of unknowability or if you are too eager about loving the manifest, the material, the obvious, then you will have to learn the art of loving a new thing, a new person every day. That obviously defeats our purpose. We want to resist change. We want to have the same person with us who met us one fine day ten years back. In fact, if that person shows even the faintest intention of changing, we charge him with disloyalty. We say, you are changing. But changing he indeed is. And he will keep changing in spite of your utmost intentions and efforts. Spirituality is the art of loving nothing and loving something that will not remain. And both are one. To love nothing is to love God, the formless. To love nothing is to love God, the formless. And to love something that will continuously change is to love God in form, in time and space. But we are not all right with both of these or either of these. We want a third possibility. That is our desire. We want a form that won't change. Now, sorry, that wish cannot be granted. If you want something that does not change, then settle for the formless. If you want something that would never, never change, then settle for nothing. Only nothing never changes. And if you want something, then settle for change because whatever is something is always going to change. But what do you want? You want something that should not change. Now, that is an impossibility. Are you getting it? Hmm? Do you see how we are unable to know or love anything, firstly ourselves. We are just like the moon. Inside of us is an endless abyss.
a total vacuum. We are not very comfortable with that. We like stuff. We don't like empty rooms, do we? We like filled rooms. And inside of us is a great, clean, unoccupied space. We do not like clean spaces, do we? And on the periphery, on the outside, we are a flow, a flow that cares for nobody, a flow that must breach all promises except the promise it made to its source and the promise it made to time. The promise that it has made to source is that I will start from you and end in you. The promise it has made to time is I will not stop. As long as time is there, I will flow. That is what you are. Look at your mind. Does it ever stop? But we hate it when it doesn't stop. We try for a thousand methods to control the mind. Don't we? Hmm? Look at your body. Does it ever stop? And look at the efforts that you put in to take control of your entire system. See what all you do just to be on top of yourself. Man is comfortable neither with his soul nor with his body mind. He is not comfortable with the soul because the soul is unknowable. And he is not comfortable with the body mind because they don't listen to his dictates. Whatever you tell the mind is a dictate towards stillness. You want the mind to be arrested somewhere. The mind won't listen to you. So you don't like the mind. Now that is a terrible situation. Neither do you like your soul. Why don't you like it? Because to like something you first of all need to know it. The soul is unknowable. So you can't like it. Nor do you like the body-mind system. Why? Because it is not controllable. It keeps flowing. Try to stop any of the flows, whether physical or mental, and you fail. Oh, you employ a lot of clever devices. That is another matter. But you still fail. The spiritual man a realized one, someone like Lalla is comfortable with both the great nothingness from where the flow arises and the unpredictability of the flow. She is alright if she does not know. And if you are alright if you do not know, then you will be also parallelly alright with the flow. Remember that you are not alright with the flow because the flow does not offer you the luxury of knowledge. When something is flowing, then knowledge fails in front of it. It is going to a direction where knowledge does not hold, stand or provide relief. Are you getting it? Be comfortable with not knowing. Be comfortable with changes of all kinds. Don't live by ideas. Don't live by anything. Just live. Hmm? Anybody here who wants to say that the crescent moon that you saw this evening is any less beautiful than the full moon? As I was walking towards the dining hall from my room, there was an electricity cut for around two minutes. 
nothing was visible except the moon and it's a crescent moon it's a very thin arc tonight and i had my friend standing in the way and the moment i touched him the first thing he uttered was beautiful that's all that he had to say beautiful and what do you have in the name of beauty such a thin arc and you want to say that this thin arc this crescent is less beautiful than the full moon you really want to say that then things are changing then they are beautiful in every form that they present as a result of the change provided you do not have fixations if you have fixations then obviously you cannot see the beauty in the various faces of the moon the moon has not only 15 faces the moon actually has an infinite number of faces but if you have certain standards of beauty if you have certain ideas of beauty then you will not be able to see and appreciate beauty and if you cannot appreciate beauty then the moon is not lessened your own moment goes wasted that was a moment of dramatic bliss just for 2 seconds there is darkness everywhere 2 minutes i call it dramatic because just like in drama a great dark stage has been set and on the great dark stage the hero has descended and who is the hero the crescent moon it was a dramatic moment you will miss that moment if you cannot appreciate the moon with all its faces so don't be stuck with ideas about property truth love and beauty you will miss everything that you have an idea about if you have an idea about a thing you are sure to miss that thing getting it hmm? since i scoured my mind and my body i too lalla am new each moment new she has not done something special everybody is new there is nothing except newness the soul is new because it cannot be old why can't it be old because to be old one requires time and the soul is timeless how can you be old if the clock is not ticking and inside of you no clock ticks so there is no question of you ever being old inside you are anyway always new no oldness exists there and on the periphery you are always changing that which was old is always being left behind so there is only newness but we do not experience that we do not live in that lalla says she also had to do something or undo something in order to remain forever new what was that she scoured her body and her mind she left them behind she burned them away she stopped taking them seriously she came into a different kind of association with herself which was not identity based and then there is only newness do you know what that newness means that newness means that now you cannot live a bored life that newness means that now you cannot live as you are you are sleeping that newness means that now 
you cannot be ever short of energy. Life presents you with so much. But to get it, to enjoy it, to live it, you require energy, don't you? And don't you see how bad is our relationship with energy? Either we don't have energy or we have energy gone mad. Either you don't have energy or you have energy gone mad. On the sports field, you will predominantly find these two kinds of characters. One, those who won't apply themselves, won't hit, won't run. And the others who are running without any rhyme or reason, just running to somewhere. Silently they are hoping that they run out of themselves. Silently they are hoping that they will run so fast that they will leave their own bodies and minds behind. You have batsmen who can't touch four successive balls because they probably find the pace of the ball too much. Do you know why you find the pace of the ball too much? Because you are not with the ball and that requires energy. When you are with something, remember this if you are a batsman, if, when, if you are with something, then its pace reduces. When you are really with something, then the pace of that thing reduces. When you are observing something, you will find that the thing has slowed down. But observation too requires a harmonious relationship with energy. You don't have that, so you don't observe. You are beaten on four successive balls. What do you do on the fifth ball? You charge out. Your energy goes mad. And what do you do? You lob a simple cash to the wicket keeper. That is how we live. Either we don't have energy or we are just crazy. Our enthusiasm know, knows no bounds. Instead of hitting the ball, we start hitting somebody's legs. Energy. I have so much of it. Seeing this. Lala is saying that her flow is natural now. All that which could have vitiated the flow, disturbed it, contained it. She has removed that. She has basically removed herself. So when she is dancing, it's only the dance. She will not say, I am dancing. It is just the dance. She has removed herself from the equation. If she is swimming, or reading, or singing, or playing, there would just be the swim, the reading, the playing, the song, the doer that we are, the afraid doer, the control freak, vanishes. Things happen 
on their own. Hmm? When things happen on their own, then things are new. When you do things, then you only do that which you are secure and comfortable with and that is the old. Because you can be secure only with that which you already know of and that means the old. If you want to get a taste of the new, remove yourself. Remove yourself and then everything is new. My teacher told me one thing, live in the soul. We must get this. Living in the soul is exactly the same as living in the body-mind. Living in the undifferentiated, unqualified truth is just the same as living in this world of qualifications, names, diversities, differences, colors, patterns. Both require one common quality and that quality is one need not be afraid of the unknown. To live in the soul, you must not be afraid of unknowability because the soul is not in a dimension that consciousness can perceive. So you are secure even without knowledge and only then you can live in the soul. The same quality of mind is also required to really love the world, love life and live blissfully. What is that quality? To live without seeking security. To live without having the support of knowledge. In the soul, in the domain of the soul, knowledge simply does not apply because that is not the dimension of knowledge. And in the domain of the world, knowledge applies but fails. Because if you apply knowledge, then all you will get is a repetition of the old. Knowledge means that which you know of. So if you have knowledge of something, what will you do? You will repeat that thing. In the world of the soul, knowledge is simply not applicable. You cannot think of the soul. And in the dimension of the world, knowledge is applicable, but if you apply knowledge, then you will be condemned to repeat and stagnate and stink. So you require one common quality, whether you are a man who is deeply of the soul or you are a man who is deeply of the world. That common quality is security. An unreasonable security. One is prepared to live without being certain through knowledge. One is still certain but not through knowledge. To have certainty without knowledge is called faith. You do not know really, but you are still certain. That is called faith. Are you getting it? Spirituality is not about avoiding the world. Real spirituality promotes and strengthens that quality within you which will help you succeed in the world as well. If you can be devoted to the heart, then the mind too will remain healthy. If you can live peacefully with the vacuum of the soul, then you will also be able to have peace with the great 
speed, the breakneck speed, and the dizzying diversity of the world of mind. The one who is all right with great nothingness, only he will be all right with a maddening diversity. Only if you can tolerate zero will you be able to make peace with infinity. The mind is the world of infinity, an infinite number of things exist in the mind. The soul is the world of zero, nothing exists there. You would either be comfortable with both or with none of them. Make peace with zero so that you can be all right with infinity. Are you getting it? Hmm? When that was so, I began to go naked and dance. What is this thing about going naked? One has to understand. Lalla's nakedness is not merely about giving up of clothes. What are clothes? Clothes are society. Would you wear clothes if nobody taught you to? Would you? Clothes are the body that society gives to you. What are clothes? Clothes too are a body. You are wearing a social body upon a biological body and that is called clothes. Hmm? Giving up of clothes means you have given up on the society. I no more have the social body. That however does not mean that Lalla was now living in the physical body. She had given up the physical body as well. And the proof of that is that she had given up the social body. Understand this. As long as you are identified very strongly with the physical body, you will have to have a social body as well. If you are conscious about your body, about your face, about your organs, then you will do things with them. You will want to either promote them or decorate them or hide them. Why does man hide his body? That is because he is identified with the body. In fact, the very reason man creates society is that he has biological identification. If you are not biologically identified, you will not want to create a society. That is the reason why even animals in varying degrees go on and create societies for themselves. Put four dogs together and you have society. Put five rabbits together and you have society. And if you are observant, you will find that their society too has certain norms. Just like yours. It's just that your norms are very well articulated, very nuanced and their norms are a little crude, a little rudimentary. Are you getting it? Body identification leads to the creation of society. In fact, historically also, this is the reason why any society came into existence or comes into existence. Give up the society and soon you will find that you are giving up on your body identification as well. That is the reason why a Mahavir has to go naked. That is why a Buddha has to go to the jungle. He is not going to the jungle. He is going away from the society. He is giving up is giving up that which is unnecessary. He is almost like a snake giving up on an entire shell, an entire covering. And Allah goes naked.
Nakedness is when you are comfortable with yourself. When you are comfortable with your soul, only then are you comfortable with your body and your mind. Most of us live in total discomfort of ourselves. What do I mean by total discomfort? We are uncomfortable with our heart and we are also uncomfortable with our thoughts. We cannot do that which our heart is always impelling us to do. And because we cannot do that, our thoughts are always crude and we keep on getting all kinds of hoary and ugly thoughts. You know why you have all that stuff in your mind, you know why your thoughts are so ugly, so ugly that you keep spending your life in guilt, so ugly that you just don't like that mind which entertains these kinds of thoughts. Your thoughts are bad because you don't have a healthy relationship with your heart. Take a plant. Keep clipping its roots. Or keep applying some kind of poison to its roots. What kind of branches and leaves would you find in that plant? Yes? Crippled. Crippled. Seen a bonsai? Its roots are not allowed to go deep. What happens to the height of the plant? What happens? When the roots are not healthy, obviously the manifested part of the plant will also not be healthy. Because you do not have a healthy relationship with your heart. So the manifested part of yourself, and what is the manifested part of yourself? Which twigs and leaves are we talking of? The body and the mind. That is why the body and the mind are also not beautiful. Our eyes are not beautiful, our faces are not beautiful. Our bodies are not beautiful. Our voice is not deep. Our songs are not mellifluous. And you think it is because of the absence of practice or application? No. It is because there is no heart in your songs, your voice, your eyes or your face. It is the radiance of the heart that makes the eyes shine. It is the touch of the heart that brings sweetness and composure to your voice. It is the touch of the heart that brings rhythm to your songs. Otherwise, you can keep practicing. You can be a very accomplished artist, but still you will not have that quality which makes life worth living. I was hearing a very accomplished singer sing songs of Meera and Kabir. I heard for a while and then I could not help smiling. She had all the nuances of voice, all the control over her craft. Yet there was nothing Meera like in the song that she sang. She was a master of her art, the singer that I heard. She was a master of her art. And yet it was so obvious that, it, that it's, it's not Meera who is singing. Somebody has just borrowed Meera's words 
and is trying to present them in the most decorated way possible. And that is not helping. You might be a singer of experience and repute. Yet you first of all need to have Meera's heart before you sing Meera. And that heart cannot come by way of practice. When you love your internal nakedness, then the physical body exudes beauty. And then even if you wear a social body, that body too is beautiful. Clothes are part of social body. Thoughts are part of social body. Mannerisms are part of social body. Identities are part of social body. Thoughts and ideologies are also part of social body. Then you can wear all of them. And there would be a great harmony. Visualize Kabir singing his own songs. Now there is a oneness. Huh? Kabir's language is social or is it not? Did Kabir invent a new language? No. So there is the social body. There is a social body. There is language. But that language is arising from an internal silence and that is why it's beautiful. Kabir singing his own songs. That is what is meant by nakedness. Meera singing her own songs. Now the outside is in great balance with, in a great tandem with the inside. Inside is nothing. And outside is a lot. That is in harmony with the nothing. Hmm? What comes first? Kabir's voice, Kabir's words or Kabir's heart? That's what Lalla's Guru had told her. He told her, be on the outside as you are on the inside. That was one instruction that he ever gave her. Be on the outside as you are on the inside. Now that means that your words should arise from your naked heart. And then they can take any shape. Of course, the shape will be determined by the body, the mind and the society. But their source must be this purity within. That source is important. That source is very important. Words outside must come from the heart inside. Be on the outside as you are on the inside. And Lalla went naked. And Lalla went naked. Lalla is naked, so is Kabir, so is Buddha. All are naked. We are not naked even if we have given up all clothes. And Kabir is naked even if he is wearing a lot. Even if we give up clothes, we do it as per the social standards, don't we? When you are in that swimming pool, then you are with very few clothes. But that swimming pool is actually a social institution. If you enter that swimming pool, Wearing your usual shorts, you would be censored. The society says, we are a particular kind of clothing while entering that pool. So even if you have to go naked, you go naked as per the benchmarks. 
Even in your bedrooms, when you go naked, don't you see what kind of protocol you follow? There is a definite directory, a definite algorithm. First this comes off, then that comes off. And finally, when the stage is set and the juices are flowing, then the last bit comes off. What do you think? You set that algorithm? What do you think? You are the creator of that process? No. Even our nakedness follows imported directions. That is no nakedness. How to improve the relationship with energy? By improving the relationship with the source of energy. The master of energy. There are these two dogs, Koham and Soham, and they turn strangely vicious after midnight. If you ever decide to come to both sthal and you are walking, you will know what I mean. They just attack everybody, randomly, blindly, after midnight, till dawn. Hmm? They keep patrolling in front of both sthal. And everybody and anybody who passes that area is barked at. Not only barked at, is actually chased. But if you are having a walk with me, they don't say anything to you. They are my pets. If you are walking with me in front of both sal, Koham and Soham will walk by your side as if they are your best buddies. To have a great relationship with Koham and Soham, show that you have a great relationship with their master. Then even without knowing you, they become respectful towards you. In fact, this much knowledge is sufficient for them. How much? That you are alright with their master. You may call me their master, their friend, their parent, whatever. Same is the case with energy. All energy arises from just nowhere. In its most subtle form, energy is consciousness. And consciousness in its subtlest form is an imperceptible awareness. In its crudest form, energy becomes matter. That is the link between the source and the world. Matter is energy, energy is consciousness, consciousness is nothing. If you can be alright with nothing, then you will be alright with consciousness, with energy and with matter. And that sums up everything. Your entire world is nothing but this. What? Consciousness, energy, matter. To be alright with the world, just be alright with the master of these three. The master of these three is? Well, you cannot know that master. That is why I am repeatedly calling that master as nobody, as nothing. Be comfortable without knowing. 
that is the key be comfortable without knowing and you will have lots of energy be comfortable without guarantees of security and you will have lots of energy a little bit of energy can be provoked even by thinking even by motivating yourself but only a little bit it won't suffice you will remain hungry there is great fun in just living living without assurances living without guarantees living without promises when you look at all this you usually try to find a meaning remember a meaning don't you when you look around what do you seek you seek meaning just change this habit just drop this habit instead of seeing a meaning see nothing look around as if you are looking at nothing ha huh? look around as if you are staring at a vacuum but to do that you will need to have vacuum inside not desires if you have desires inside you cannot look at the world as if you are looking at a vacuum look at things and see nothing try that look at things and see nothing try that 